Please welcome to the stage, Calvin Cato! I'm here live. Hello, everybody. <laughs> I'm glad I wore my good blazer for this. <laughs> um, so it's spring of 2015 in New York City, um, and I'm with my father in the doctor's office, and the doctor tells my father, your liver cancer is advancing, and we need to discuss options. And the scariest word in that sentence is the word options. Because my dad had been diagnosed with liver cancer for a year and a half now, and if you looked at him, you couldn't even tell. Like, it was such an innate part of him for a year and a half that it was just something that you would mention offhandedly, like in an, like an OK Cupid profile, you know? You'd say, like, oh, I have brown eyes, black hair, liver cancer, long walks on the beach. Like, it was something that never really sank in until the doctor said options. And so he told, walked us through the options, and he said, well, there's either surgery, which would be a bit invasive, there's a liver transplant, there's chemotherapy, there's radiation, and then there's a combination of chemotherapy and radiation. And I looked at my dad, and my dad chose chemotherapy and radiation combination, and we'll see how it goes. And he said, okay, well, if you're gonna choose that, what it's gonna be is it's gonna be five weeks of treatment from Monday through Friday, you're gonna have to be here at 9 a.m. for treatment. Treatment's gonna take anywhere from two to four hours, and then you have to go home. And then the doctor looks at me and says, can you take care of your dad through this? And I said, yes, because of course I can. But taking care of my dad in this way involves doing three things that I hate. Uh, one is driving in New York City, because it's awful. <laughs> I had to relearn how to drive, and I swear to God, I've never used the word fuck in so many different permutations. <laughs> Did you know fuck can be a noun, a verb, and an interjection? Because it can be. <laughs> Just drive up Third Avenue, it's terrible. The second thing I had to do was wake up early, which I'm really terrible at. But the third thing, which is gonna be the roughest part, was I'm gonna have to spend at least four uninterrupted hours one-on-one -on -one with my father. And to give you a sense of like how my father and I could not be more different people. Like my dad is a big man. He was like 6'2", 250 pounds, like from Jamaica. Like real, like not Sebastian from the Little Mermaid Jamaica. Like real. <laughs> like I wake up and brush my teeth with curry goat Jamaica. <laughs> and in contrast, I am a slight, you know, 5'8", 140 on Grindr. Um, <laughs> full-time comedian at the time. And I said full-time comedian not because I made money at it, <laughs> but because I was just fired from yet another job. So <laughs> by default, I'm making negative $10 a day. So that's what I was doing. Um, but I said, you know what? Nevertheless, he persisted. I was gonna do this. I went to Zipcar, I rented a car, um, and I practiced driving so that I could do this for my father. And so I get ready, I gear up, and I'm driving my dad on day one of the five weeks of treatment. And day one is silent, like a very palpable, like Uber driver wanting five stars silence. <laughs> it is rough. And so, but we make it through and I was like, okay, I can do day two of this. So we get to day two. And day two is, there's some talking, but it's more him talking at me about how terrible my driving is. <laughs> It's always a, you're driving too slow. Why did you cut this person off? Why didn't you cut this person off? Also, when are you gonna get a job? And I'm just like white knuckling it the entire time <laughs> because I don't wanna like just jump out of the car because I've ruined my face and I need my face. So <laughs> I'm like, I'm gonna put up with this. It's okay. This is about my dad. And so right before I drop him off after we go through the treatment, I tell my dad, I'm gonna bring CDs in the car so that we can just have ambient music instead of silence or you criticizing me. And so I bring a flotilla of CDs for day three, and you know, there's some that he likes, some that he doesn't like, but the one that he really fixates upon is Eminem, <laughs> which makes no sense for a 58-year-old Jamaican man <laughs> who went to register nurse to like Eminem. <laughs> But I would put that Eminem CD in, and every time I would, he'd be like, that white boy is so angry. <laughs> and so crazy. <laughs> and it opened up some small talk, at least. So I do this, and at the end of the week, I, I, I put in the CDs, we're listening like normal, 
I get distracted and I miss the exit that I need to take to get back to his house. And he says, hey, you missed the exit that we needed to take. And I said, oh, I, I'm really sorry. I wasn't paying attention. And he said, oh, well, we're actually close to Coney Island. Do you want to just go to Coney Island? And I hadn't gone to Coney Island with my dad in like several years. Again, my dad and I, we weren't close. We didn't really talk. Like the closest conversation that was deep that we had was maybe a year before that where I had to teach him how to use the space bar on his cell phone. And that was it. And like, I didn't even know what we would talk about. Like, I mean, I use phrases like, deconstruct the white male hegemony, like on the regular. Like, <laughs> he can't relate. <laughs> but we go to Coney Island and we get hot dogs from Nathan's and he said, hey, why don't we walk along the pier? And we start to walk along the pier. And my dad says, so you're still doing stand up?" And I said, yes, yes I am. And he said, oh, how's that going? And I said, well, it's, you know, it's going well for what it is. And he says, you should talk to Steve Harvey. <laughs> which does not make any modicum of sense. <laughs> I clearly do not know Steve Harvey. <laughs> but it was the first time I, that my dad tried. My dad tried to understand. He tried to be there and say, hey, this is what I know about comedy is Steve Harvey. Be a king of comedy, see what happens. And so conversely I asked my dad, I'm like, how do you feel? You know, you worked as a registered nurse and now you're kind of on the other side of it. How does that feel? And he said, it, sucks. I don't like feeling in this powerless way. And I asked him, well, you know, what was the craziest thing you've ever had to handle as a registered nurse? And he said, well, there's one time I had to pull a knife out of a guy, but he survived. So it's not a big deal. And it was, I could not believe that he was talking about this so casually. And we just kept walking along the boardwalk and we just really got to share and bond about each other's lives. And then we walked back to the car and I got back in and I drove him back home. And I said, well, um, it's Friday, but I will see you Monday and we'll continue the drive. And then week two rolls around and it's like that one moment, the floodgates just started to open and we started to actually just talk to each other. And so in the middle of the week, I made another detour, but this time I actually was sort of like not accidentally doing it, I sort of planned it. And so I said, hey, oh, whoops, we're on our way to Rockaway Beach, which is another place that my dad and I used to go when I was younger and we would ride our bikes. And he said, well, hey, why don't we get out and walk? And we did the same thing. We got out, we walked, we shared about each other's lives. My dad stopped giving me comedy advice, which was very helpful. But <laughs> we got to just talk. And, and it was so freeing and nice. And then I was like, you know what? Like, I just want to keep doing this. And so I would continue to just make detours. And my dad figured out that they were not detours. <laughs> it was more me deliberately doing this. And we would just detour and like just get to drive to all these places. And if my dad is feeling strong enough, we would get out and walk. And if my dad wasn't feeling strong enough, we would just drive, just keep driving and talking. And there's one time where my dad, we were talking about his old coworkers, and he said, oh, it would be nice if I could catch up with my coworkers. And I just happened to drive past where his old, one of his old coworkers lived. And I luckily, we got there and I parked and they were on the porch. And they, we just started talking. And like my dad just started talking about like sh swapping like nurse war stories. And it was amazing. I had never seen my, the side of my dad before. Where I'm like, oh, my dad has friends and he talks to them. Oh my God. <laughs> it was awesome. And then at the same time, like my dad was also talking about how um, he said, oh, I also like, um, one of my friends is like this doctor who's gay, but he's fine, which is very progressive for my dad, trust me. <laughs> Again, Jamaican, very old school, blood of mercy. So like, we talk, so, and he's talked about it. And the thing is, that as much as I was sharing all this stuff with my dad, my dad was sharing stuff with me, the one thing I never got to tell my dad was that I was gay. And so when my dad talked about this gay doctor and he was like, oh, you know, he was just like a regular person, he was fine. I just didn't like the fact that he gossiped so much. And I was like, 25% of our conversations are you gossiping about your neighbors? Like, what are you talking about? We all gossip. <laughs> You just call it sharing the news, like it's the same thing. <laughs> but after we had that conversation, I was like, okay, well, as we continue to do this, I'm gonna ramp up to the fact that I can just tell him that I'm gay. And so we keep having these drives, we keep having these detour drives, 
we keep having these like deeper and deeper conversations and I'm trying to find the right moment to tell him, you know, like I don't want to spring it on on a bad day, but I also don't want to spring him on on a good day. And then part of me was like, well, maybe I'll find a nice guy and then he'll just like see me with him together and be like, oh, good for you. I won't have to pay your cell phone bill anymore. And then he could just let it go. But this, this keeps happening, this keeps happening. And then at the end of the five weeks, my the doctor says, oh, uh, the five weeks are up. Your dad's body needs to rest. So you don't have to continue to drive him to and from the doctor's office every day. And I, we get in the car, we take another detour. And my dad says, I know that it's time for my body to rest. But in case anything happens, I want you to know that I don't want to be resuscitated. I've been on the other side of this and I've seen how people like are on life support for like months and years and it's just not the way I want to live. And I said, yes, I, uh, of course, uh, if you say don't resuscitate, I won't resuscitate. But all, so this isn't going to be what's going to happen. And he said, I know that's what you think, but I want you to know that just in case, do not resuscitate me. But we still continue having our drives. Everything's fine until two months later when my dad calls me and he says, I have to go to the hospital immediately. And this is a Wednesday. And so we go into the hospital, I check my dad in, and the nurses and doctors are fretting over him. They're trying to figure out what's going on. Uh, I leave that Wednesday and I come back Thursday. And I'm, I'm worried, you know, I don't wanna have to deal with what may come. But I get back on Thursday and my dad's feeling a little bit, little bit more lively, he's feeling better. And what's scary is that Friday, I had a big show that I was supposed to do. Um, it was a show that was going to be like this big queer showcase in the Boston area um, before there was straight prides there. And um, <laughs> it's a big deal. I was very happy about this. And I said, if you want, I can cancel the show. I can be here for you. And he said, I know comedy is really important to you. I want you to go and do this show. I'll be out of here. Don't worry about it. So I leave on Friday and I do the show. And the show goes amazingly. It's like one of the best shows I've ever had. It's a wonderful audience. And then I finish the show and I get a call from my mom and she says, your dad isn't waking up. I, you need to come home. Can you come home? So I cancel the Saturday show. I take an overnight bus. I come back. And then I come back and I see him Saturday morning. And somehow Saturday morning, he's awake again. And I said, oh, okay, this is great. This is good. I don't care about the money. I'm just glad that you're awake. And he said, of course I'm awake. I'm fine. I had a blood transfusion. I'm going to be okay. Don't worry about me. I'm going to be out of here on Sunday. And so I go home, I go to sleep, and then I wake up in the middle of the night to a call from the doctor who says that you need to come in immediately. And so I come in and I wait for my mother to show up as well. And the doctor is talking to us and says, your dad has slipped into a coma. And we're not really sure what we can do. And we're doing everything that we can at this point to stabilize him and keep him okay. But we need to discuss options. And there's that word again, options. But this time, it's not a series of five options. There's really only two options, which is we can either continue to revive, revive him and keep him on life support, or if you tell us not to resuscitate, we won't resuscitate. And I didn't think I would have to get to the point where it was really one option. It's not two options. My dad told me what he wanted. And so I wait, and I wait, and I wait, and I watch this machine go from like beep and then every once in a while it would flatline a team of nurses would come in it would beep again and then by the third time the doctor asks me to make the call and so I tell the doctor what my dad wanted and I want to say that that Saturday was the last conversation I ever had but I had one more conversation with my dad after that which was at the funeral and I get to the funeral and so many like family friends showed up, so many coworkers from my dad's uh, hospital show up. And it's, it's stunning. I, I didn't know so many people cared about him. And, and as much as my dad shared all these stories, it was nice to meet all the people who were in those stories this entire time. And I wait until everyone files out. And it's just me and my dad in the casket. And I look over at my dad and I tell him, I'm really sorry. And I really thought we would have more time to talk. And also, I'm gay. <laughs> I love dick. <laughs> and it was the first time that I wish my dad would have woken up and criticized me. Thank you very much.